Hello, everyone. Welcome to another new installment of Club Moffat Talks. I'm back, and I'm Chris, your instruction librarian. I'm Joseph. I'm also an instruction librarian. And I'm just here for the fun. I'm Ryan Samuelson. We are uh, going to be without a guest today because it's the end of the semester. We thought we would just have a fun little informal episode talking about, um, well, actually doing what we used to do back when we didn't really have an idea of what we wanted to do with this. We're going to talk about a very special topic, and this one, uh, this one's very special. Um, it is also very timely because here in about four or five days, yeah. it's going to be Mother's Day, and I hope that um, the rest of you are doing something very nice for your mothers. So we thought we would get around and just kind of, kind of huddle up and in our separate offices and uh talk about some of our favorite be it good or bad fictional mothers um let's see joe you want to take it away this was your you brought this up as a topic so i'm going to go ahead and just well 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 i will point out point of order point of order we have a schedule do we yes we do we have a, a general schedule we need to follow and we're on step number two which is what's going on this week what have you that's watched? Like, what have with you us. Oh, with us. Oh, that's right. I forgot. There's there are people who are involved with this thing. That's right. It's I'm rusty. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Ryan, what are you up to this week or lately? Um, I have been watching the final seasons of The Marvelous Miss Maisel and the final seasons of Ted Lasso, and they are amazing. Also, Star Trek Vision, uh, I'm sorry, Star Wars Visions came out last week and i mentioned that in the last pad cost it was fine i don't think it was as good as the first um season the second season all seemed to follow the same pattern but again i do like the fact they opened it up to european and asian and south american and north american um um animators and as i mentioned last time it's amazing that disney's going out and saying hey competitors have fun in our world come out and 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 have fun playing around with with our with our with our franchise. Well, they dropped millions upon millions of dollars to not have fun with their franchise, so I'm glad that someone gets to. And that's what I that's what I've been watching and, and looking at and paying attention to from the last few weeks. Cool, cool. I liked Ms. Marvelous Miss Maisel. I, I mean, I only watched a few episodes of it, but I really liked what I saw. They're finally Don't doing do what I thought they should have done from the beginning. And that is they're doing time skips. Hmm. Oh. So okay. the, the original one took place in like 1958, I think, was the first season. Current season is like 1961, something like that. Hmm. Uh, but they hinted the fact that bigger and greater things come, basically. And so they've been doing they've been doing time jumps to the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. To show how the characters end up and what's going on with them and stuff like that. And I really like that. As a history major, I really enjoy shows that do that. Although online, I've seen lots of people complaining about it. And I'm like, no, that's the fun stuff. It reminds me of uh, John Updike. How he would write his stories and they'd be like decades apart or whatever. Hmm. Joe, what are you up to lately? Uh, well, uh, Ryan knows that I've been having trouble with a, a vehicle. Uh are uh, a weekend or two ago we went down to Scarborough Fair, uh, which I highly recommend to anyone who hasn't been, or if you have been, and you know it's like like those weird commercials for like Wolf Brand Chili. You know, it's like how long has it been since you had Wolf Brand Chili? Well, that's too long. You should have some. Uh, but like that, but for Scarborough Fair, if you've never been, if you went yesterday. You should go again you know it's uh it uh i have never gone there and had a bad time ever uh as far as like at the fair and the things that happened there on the way home uh our car overheated and we were stuck on the side of the road for a while and then had to have a tow truck come and get the car and drag it to wichita falls that was that was lots of fun and it's been uh in and out of the shop ever since because uh, they can't seem to fix it. Oof. I'm not going to mention the place where I've been putting it, because I'm nicer than that. <laughs> not a lot, but just <clears throat> that much, that much nicer than that. 
I get um, that. I, I'm just vindictive enough that I would, if if they know who they are, then that's all that matters. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, so because of that, I've been a little bit like mentally, emotionally distracted. And so I haven't done the reading or things that I'd intend to do. Uh, we have watched all of the previous seasons of Mrs. Maisel. So we will be watching that but we haven't started this last season yet. Um, we've been like watching kind of comfort movies, uh, you know, things that we've seen multiple times before, but it's like, okay, we know the good guys win in this. Let's watch this, uh, you know? And, uh, but I haven't done that much reading or anything like that. I've just been otherwise mentally engaged. How about you? Yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to really enjoy yourself when um you can see the dumpster fire right outside your your window and you just see it happening and you're like ah uh, can't really do anything about that now but mm, I know yeah. it's happening yeah. um not a whole lot um my my daughter has been um she's learning how to get her way uh lately which is to say she's becoming much more aggressively needy mm -hmm. which um she's 16 months she she turned 16 months less than a week ago so um between that and um currently just finished a um cataloging course for my master's degree so um not a whole lot of time to really focus on things i know i'm make, i'm doing this a lot right now and i promise you i'm not on drugs my nose is very very itchy um, it's allergy season here in Wichita Falls, and um, my I my eyes have been half closed pretty much for a week now. It's just been misery. I I hate this time of year. Um, see, I'm doing it again. Uh, playing some video games lately. I haven't really felt like reading yet. I got to about the end of the first book of Fellowship of the Ring, and I was like, yeah, I'll, I'm gonna read this later. Um, also because we, uh, we stopped giving my daughter a, uh, bottle of milk before bed. So, um, I didn't get to finish reading The Hobbit. So it kind of, I kind of fell off after that. Um, playing a video game franchise called Fire Emblem. It's mm -hmm. kind of older. It's been around for a, a while. It's a Nintendo exclusive franchise, um, strategy games. Uh, so there, there's a win condition in them where you you don't want to lose any of your units because they they die permanently. So um, the time on those have said like you finish the game at like twenty something hours or whatever. And I just know that I as soon as someone dies, I hit the reset button and and start over again. So that's been a lot more stressful than I need right now. But there's something cathartic about seeing big number go up. Mm -hmm. Um what else um my favorite video game ever now that came out last year uh xenoblade 3 just got its last story expansion and it's perfect ending that i think i i could have possibly asked for so i've been riding high off that for like the last two weeks or so hmm. other than that um yeah not a whole lot uh baby and graduate school taking up pretty much all of my attention otherwise yeah that's fair. You're Ryan. I'm the viewers are going to hate me doing this. I got you. I saw. I, I said after you've you've listed like five things you've done. The yeah, but I don't remember any of them. Yeah, sorry. I had to mute because apparently my my Discord group was having a discussion. I just sort of kept beeping constantly. <laughs> <Wow>. <clears throat> okay, I think that takes care of what we've been doing lately. Um, anything else on the itinerary that we should? get to before we jump into our topic well it says um after we talk about what's going on on campus which is final so nothing really um mm -hmm. and what we are reading watching or playing it says we need to introduce the primary topic oh yeah we're all out of order today <laughs> yeah so uh to reiterate we kind of want to talk today about uh some of our favorite moms in fiction just because it's a uh, very topical um it's Mother's Day soon, so it doesn't have to necessarily be what's your favorite good mom. It doesn't necessarily have to be what's your favorite bad mom. Just what's what's a can you think of a mom that's in fiction that that just really stands out to you? 
I've got a couple that came to mind, but they're all science fiction horror stuff. Go, hey, uh, favorite is favorite. That's all that matters. Uh, Octavia Butler's Blood Child was was particularly haunting. Um, it's it's basically a version of Alien, except you like the uh, the xenomorph because it's your it, because it's it 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 made you its mommy, you know. So and the other thing I think of is Philip Jose Farmer's Strain Relations. And that one is just oh, it was popular enough. He wrote uh, he wrote sequels to it, but um, yeah, that one is is out there. So what is it? What is the motherhood of it that's that's so fascinating to you? It, 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 it's 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 all like I said. It is it is science fiction horror versions of motherhood. Like I said, uh, Blood Child is about. Um, a uh a mother who's going to kill you and impregnate you with her eggs and um strain strange relations is about a um a predator that um mates with you and then kills you afterwards so yeah so uh, i don't know that's it says something about my weird twisted psyche that those are the first two mothers that came to mind i think uh well, you know what? That's that's yours. That's that's your choices. Um, <laughs> you can say what I, you can you can choose whatever you want, but um, I am going to say that I, I'm not sure that you understood the assignment because uh, <laughs> I don't know if those are. I mean, uh, yeah, those are sure. Those are technically mothers. So, okay. Actually, you didn't say what the favorite was. You said what's mother stood out most in your mind was the prompt I was given, and so I was like, okay, yeah, it's the horror stuff that really stuck with me because it is. It was very shocking to read those short stories and go, yeah. So that's what stuck in my mind. They are not yeah. my favorites, however. Okay. Um, well, since um, since I went last on the um, introductions, I guess I'll I'll take the middle here. Sure. Um, I've got, like I said, I've got two. One of them is a specific one. The other is a kind of a template, a mother template. Um, and when I point my hands up like this i realize how small my hands are so um everyone here and watching the video on youtube you get to see me realize a moment of body dysmorphia that i've never had before in my whole life so enjoy that um <clears throat> so some things uh, happened recently but um one thing that um i'm just so proud of is that um literally this morning uh like not even Six hours ago, as of this recording, my mom got to do um, one of her lifetime goals, which was uh, she's been showing, uh, like, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? Uh, not, I think it's obedience showing uh, pit bulls, American Staffordshire Terriers, um, for a, a long time. She's been showing them since I was uh, like a preteen. I, I it's not my thing, but um, she that's that's something that's been near and dear to her forever. She's she's loved taking care of um, staffies, I guess is the technical term. So people don't immediately shut the video off. Um, but today she got to go to Westminster, the uh, the big, super important televised dog show. Uh, her dog was shown on Fox Sports. For a few minutes, uh, didn't win, but just the fact that she went was it was a big life goal for her. But kind of made me realize that uh, just how much she tried to do that while also raising me. She waited until I was older uh, before she started doing this. She waited until she was married before she started showing dogs, just so that it wasn't like a a full time thing that I had to deal with. Uh, she put a lot of stuff on the back burner. Uh, my mom is was a single parent for the longest time um and it it doesn't really i guess it doesn't really appear as such a big deal until you start to become a parent yourself and you realize how much of a big ordeal that is um the other night my daughter ezra did something silly and hit her head doing something because she's a toddler in fact last night um we were playing a game, uh, a game with structured rules where I would stand up and she would run between my legs and laugh and then she would come back around and do it again. 
Um, but um, she uh, went way too fast and ran directly into the wall in her playpen and then fell down on her on her back, which I described to a friend as a Chris Farley moment for a toddler. Shouldn't have been as funny as it was, but I mean, I I had to stifle my laughter. But it was it was in that moment after that where we picked her up and I said All right, and she wanted to go to her mom and it was we've been saying it for a while. Like there's nothing like when you feel, especially when you're when you're really really little, there's nothing that's gonna make you feel as good as just your mom being there. And it kind of made me think like that that must have been that must have been just very difficult for. For my mom, being a single mom. So, um, recently I've kind of had to reevaluate something that is, it's not necessarily um, a mom character, but it's a, a mother-like figure. Uh, at least one of the interpretations is, and that is Shel Silverstein's The Giving Tree. A um, lot of interpretation, is, it, like I've seen recently, I, apparently it's also... Um, discussed as a, a, a Christian metaphor or just like just a general religious allegory of the act of giving. I always read it as a metaphor for parenthood. And now, especially the the fact, like the, the whole point of, of this little book is that the little kid comes up to the tree and asks for something and the tree's like, yeah, sure, here you go. And by the end of it, the tree is a stump and the kid is still kind of asking it for things. And this this former giant tree, which is now a stump, just says, yeah, sure, whatever I can give you. Um, and that kind of embodied this idea that that I've been kind of thinking of where where I didn't really realize just how big and how important it is that, you know, your mother is there and she's the she's just this this point in your life that that it, it's it's hard to to not think about it like that. I don't know. It's it's um. I've I've had kind of weird, profound moments like that recently, but uh, thinking about it in in those terms, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just it was it's just a it's a lovely little book, and it's a a lovely kind of even though it it kind of seems dark, and some people take it as like a sign of abuse. That's that's one of the metaphors, or that's one of the the discussions of it is like it's a about an abusive relationship or someone's taking and taking and not giving anything back, but. That's kind of what being a parent is about is you're you're accepting that you are going to be giving yourself to this little person for the rest of your life. And um yeah, I don't know. Uh, so that's that's something that as soon as as soon as I remembered the the prompt was thinking about some mothers, and it's like, well, that's I mean, that's like the almost idealized kind of fictional mother there in, in terms of personal sacrifice. Um so that's 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 it. That's all I wanted to talk about with that one. Well, no, I feel like I'll, I'll save the other one for later. Excuse me. Oh, we lost Joe for a second. Yeah, well, no, he, I feel like a chump because you said something profound, and I said something um, moderately horrific and humorous. <laughs> now he's got to find the the. He's got to find the uh, middle point between the two. Yeah, well, that, that's what I was hoping he would do, but um, unfortunately, apparently he had to, he had to help someone. So, um, yeah. yeah, we're stuck with me being just some weird, you being a thoughtful, wonderful dad, me just being some <clears throat> some weirdo. I guess the xenomorph queen kind of is a <laughs> a, a good mother figure, right? I didn't want to talk about. Well, um, let me let me let me creatures. back mine up, and I will actually give a good mother representation from literature. One of the okay. things that I'm teaching in the fall is the um, the 1980s class, and the professor I'm teaching it with, his selection of books are incredibly dark. They're just very dark, very nihilistic, very um, hopeless, so to speak. And we've been trying for a long time to get minority women writers involved in in the class the problem is all the really notable uh, women and minority writers of that time mostly didn't write about the 80s they wrote about earlier times so you have things like the joy luck club you have things like the color purple you have things like beloved which are talking about you know in some cases a century before the 1980s 
anyway, there was a book that I suggested, um, and I went ahead and got a copy of it and read it earlier this year, and that's The Bean Trees. And you want to talk about a novel that is a celebration of motherhood. It is, it is that novel. It is about, it's about, um, it's all aspects of, of mothers, children, and daughter and being a daughter. Um, it's a very, it's, 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 it is a celebration of motherhood and found families and giving support to those in need around you. So the I bean will, trees, you said? The bean trees. Yes. Huh. Is that is that King Solver? Yep. Okay. Huh. Okay. Hmm. So, so I'm going to try to force, I also I'm have try read to force the professor to accept it, along with our other novels, which are um, Less Than Zero, uh, White Noise, uh, Watchmen, and Neuromancer, which are all, of course, really happy, wonderful little 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 stories about the 1980s. Really hate that you can talk about motherhood with Watchmen, but um, that's. That is kind of that is kind of a theme that appears in Watchmen. So, uh... oh, well, it is the thing I like about it is it uh, is one of the things I did when I was reading it is I read it specifically is how can where is it touching on similar themes of the other works, hmm. and I found numerous places where it was. It's a yeah. it has the timelessness of less than zero. It goes into the aspects of media that um, uh, that white noise does. It addresses the underclasses that you get a little bit of in Neuromancer. Um, and so I thought it'd be a good fit. So hopefully I'm going to push for it uh, because I think uh, also, as I told another instructor uh, yesterday, the students are kind of crying for a novel they like because in the last time we did the class, we did a survey. Who here likes the books we're reading? And nobody raised their hand. They said, we hate all of these books. These are horrible. These are horrible books about horrible people that you're making us read. And uh, the, I did me. like the professor's response. He was, you're all getting uh, English majors. That's pretty much what English literature is. Horrible people doing listen, horrible things. Listen, listen. <laughs> you will be happy to find one book in your entire English literature program that you will ever read again. I'm sorry. I have an English degree. It's just part of the thing. You're not going to like all of them. Anyway. I'm so sorry. So I'm going to put forth the bean tree because it's about single motherhood and it's about found, found families. It's about being a mother, maybe not a biological mother, but being a true mother to someone in need. So I'm, that's that's what I'm going to, going to. I'm going to shift gears and go with that since we're, we're going to go, we're going to go positive instead of Ryan's usual dark and and nihilistic um, 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 view of motherhood. Well, I, th I think you'll probably both get a kick out of my second one. But Joe, did you want to talk about your picks? Sure. Um, I, I kind of wanted to look at uh, the world of the Raoul Dahl story, Matilda. Um, and I think that you, we talked about this a little bit before, Chris. But um, I think that when you look at either of the movie versions probably the stage version or the book, you get that thing where you have some bad mother figures and, a, and at least one good one. You've got Matilda's actual biological mother, uh, Mrs. Wormwood, who uh, kind of ignores her, doesn't understand her, doesn't get her, doesn't know how old she is, you know? Uh, and you... And then, of course, like with the principal of the school, uh, Trunchbull, you have that kind of thing, too, where she hates all children, you know. But then you have the teacher, uh, Miss Honey, who is kind and uh, empathetic and sympathetic and understanding and supportive and is those things that a mother should be uh, without being biologically attached to Matilda, she very much becomes her mother. Uh, and so I, I, I like I like that. Um, it's like even when you look at people who are biological mothers, I like to look at the way that they are with children that aren't their own. Like uh, 
in the movies or in the books if you look uh, at Molly Weasley from the Harry Potter series. Yes, she has a bunch of her own children, but she also just takes in, uh, she takes in Harry, she takes in Hermione uh, and embraces them. And it's like, I'm your mom now too. And, and like, uh, and of course, like in those stories, Harry really needed that. Um, Hermione, not so much because as far as we can tell, she actually had kind loving parents. But still, it's, it's just Molly's nature to bring everyone into her fold. Anyone she that she cares have a about mom, is her though. kid. That's the... I'm sorry, what? She doesn't have a witch mom, though. She doesn't have someone that's, like, really maternal with her in that world. Like, she's split between two different worlds, and Molly yeah. still it appears like a mother figure to her regardless. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's truth to that. I get that. But what's what's funny about about Molly, um, and also I was I was rewatching um, Chamber of Secrets with my daughter the the other day, and I was talking to some friends on Discord. I was like, man, Molly Weasley can sometimes be the most obnoxious author self insert I've ever seen, can't she? And everyone's like, yeah, but she's um, she's amazing. What are you talking about? Um, but it's the fact that she's so hard on her children, all of her kids except for like Percy she's she's just so demanding of them but then you see what they do when they're not supervised it's like well sure she's she's really kind and gentle with harry and hermione and, and um jenny and like, all her other kids she is but ron and and george and fred really really need that that stern hand and um papa weasley i can't remember his name um Arthur, yeah, he's just not gonna. He's just not going to. He thinks he thinks everything is too fascinating and and funny and and interesting. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's that's true. That's that's the way those stories go. Um, and 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 is that thing? Um, my dad talked sometimes about loving your kids the same amount but not necessarily in the same way because they're individuals so you have that thing like with molly and and specifically ron fred and george they needed more structure and they needed more discipline because even with it they had a tendency to kind of run wild so without it they would have just been you know, little little screaming maniacs. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I I I think that I think that that's the deal with that. You know, because she she had her kids that she wasn't worried about. I mean, in in that kind of a way, she had her kids, and now I can't think of the older boy's name, uh, like the one that did like uh, Dragon raised Warning. dragons and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but. Um, she had the ones that she wasn't worried about because she knew that they had, they were self-disciplined, that they would take care of themselves in that way that she didn't have to be strict with. Bill? Bill Weasley? Bill? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, so it, it's it's just that thing. Um, I do like, and I do like looking at those, those uh, characters that fulfill that fulfill that mother role without being biologically attached. Um, I know that my wife really likes uh, the Anne of Green Gables stories. And of course, Anne in those is an orphan and she gets adopted. And, you know, you look at that mother figure and how the story starts off with them maybe not having the best relationship because it's new, you know, but it grows. Um, and and those ties become so important, you know. That's what I well, got. I was thinking about in terms of the the strict mom. Um, mm. Have have the both of you? I know Ryan. I know you have. But Joe, did you ever watch Malcolm in the Middle? I did. Did you ever see the flashback where where Lois is um, is so? optimistic and hopeful about the future with her kids 
I don't think I saw that one. You have to wonder what she would be like if her kids were not demons. Because she's so kind and she's so loving and so optimistic and every one of them is worse than the last. Until you get to Malcolm. And then it goes back to Dewey and he's still a horrible monster. But um, Yeah, but you also had flashbacks of her in high school and she was the same horrible uh, vitriol type character back then too though. Yeah, it's just that all of her kids are so horrible that you have to wonder, did they do that to her or was it the other way around? Was her attitude what what kind of led all the kids to being like that? Except for when she's pregnant with Reese, she talks about how he's literally boxing her guts and like he's he's like causing problems the whole time. So I don't know. I, I think that's that's kind of also similar to how Molly is with, with everyone else. Because when um when Lois is with other kids, she's really kind. She's still kind of domineering a little bit, but she's still really she's she's more wholesome and she's definitely more uh she has more of a gentle touch with literally everyone else. Well, yeah. she also has the uh hold on. You're going to have someone knock on your door, I think. Uh... All right, I'll be back. Okay, we'll we'll go on without you. We'll go on without you. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, for those of you who don't know, we are the public services department of the library. So if somebody comes in needing help, um, one of us has to answer, which is kind of why Joe jumped off a couple times. It's why I keep looking to the side because I'm checking emails that are coming in and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we can't actually block a time off where we are doing, um, where we will all be available to do stuff. The phone call that I got was actually my mechanic who says that the car is really for sure ready now. Oh, good. So I hope that that's true. Uh, but and, he said and, that twice before, though, so. Yes. But, but, but if the car is actually in good working order, then I could actually, you know, take Athena somewhere for for a Mother's Day thing, um, it's a little well, bit. I funny, will say but... something else about Mother's Day. Um, inflation is a real thing. Yes, because I bought my mom. I I live um, over a hundred miles away from my mom, um, and I usually just buy her um, flowers. Mm -hmm. And she always says I don't need to, but my dad then afterwards says, "Yeah, go ahead and buy her flowers." It's a lot of money now. <laughs> it's a lot of money. Yeah. A card with a handwritten note goes a long way. Uh, that's what my mother says. I just like a handwritten card. My dad goes, no, you need to get her flowers. She really loves it, it when you get her flowers. You can get like a big thing of assorted chocolates on Amazon for how My mom long. would prefer flowers over chocolates. Yeah. yeah. Find what your mom likes. Listeners. She likes flowers. She but likes she flowers, keeps saying flowers. That, um, Oh, you don't have to do anything for me. I got her to the point now she says, all right, either do Mother's Day or my birthday. Don't do both. So my dad will probably tell me you need to do both. <laughs> sure. You gotta do both. Yeah. Uh we, we have a thing in my household where uh I typically do the cooking. So it's not weird for me to cook for my wife. I usually do, but for special occasions, her birthday, Mother's Day, anniversary, stuff like that. I'll see if she wants me to make her like a special meal, something that I don't make very often, or if she'd rather go out to eat or something else. Um, and so this year we're doing a uh, chicken pot pie, which is a thing that she really likes. This is just a funny thing that happened. And I'm gonna go ahead and say it here because by the time this actually is posted and airs, and specifically by the time my wife sees it, Mother's Day will have passed. But um, she was talking about a thing that she really wanted for Mother's Day, but she was talking about it to me yesterday. She was talking about it on Monday. Um, and I said, well, I've already ordered your, your present, you know? Uh, and she said, well, is it this thing? And it's like, well, if it is, why would I tell you that? <laughs> it is. It is the thing that she, 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 she said. But the thing is, is that like a week or two ago, she just kind of casually mentioned, like, not in conjunction with Mother's Day. Just, you know, there's this thing that I kind of want. I want one of these. It's like, oh, okay. And I made a note of that. I was like, I'm going to get that for her for Mother's Day. 
And so I, I, I did. I, I, I ordered it Sunday or Monday. And then at home last night, she was like, you know, I'd like to have this thing for Mother's Day. It's like, well, we'll have to see what happens. Well, that, that's showing your hand. You, what you should have said it was, I've already ordered you something, but maybe next year is what you should have said. And then she would really be surprised when you pull it yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 okay, here's, here's the thing. I used to lie all the time for no reason, just because to see what I could get away with, see what I could make people believe, just whatever. And I never got tired of it. <laughs> I just, I just got to the thing where it's like, it's not fun and it doesn't really serve a purpose for me. Uh, so because of that, in the last so many years, I've started just being more and more honest and I try to not say anything that's deliberately dishonest. I mean, sometimes I say stuff that's incorrect, that I'm wrong about, but I try to not deliberately mislead anybody anymore, uh, which is not to say that I couldn't. I could. I'm a theater <laughs> major. So I can my, lie. It's in my power. Yeah, but uh, I just, I, I choose to not. Uh, for, for, well, as you for guys know, part. I'm brutally honest. So if my mom ever asked me, did you get flowers from this here? Uh, in my defense, I would say, yeah, of course I did. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Now, I have a trickster spirit. Um, and whenever it comes to, like, if someone says something that, um, like, uh, my small group of friends, if they say something that I can spin to make sound more entertaining than it is, I'll 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 try to do that if I can, just because mm -hmm. then they'll call me out and say I'm a liar and say this is actually what happened. I say, yeah, but it's funnier and more interesting the way that well, I Well, I do that as well. That's just elaborating on the truth. I mean that's just that's just it's never telling. no, it's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, it's not I, the, I, I take true stories and I I I, I maybe you know smush the time together a little bit or I over exaggerate aspects of it to make it a better story. But the core of it's the truth. So I'm not like that. I, I recently had the the most um the most amazing compliment I think I've ever gotten, which is, man, Chris sure knows how to spin a yarn. Um, but the other thing is that I'll do the present tricksterness as well, where if I'm really unsure if I if I either want a present or like if I'm like, okay, I really like, I think I told my mom I need to choose, right? Like I really need some new shoes. And um, with that, I would just say that and drop it. But if I was like, Ooh, I wonder if I got this neat thing that that I mentioned offhandedly once, like new glasses or whatever. And then I'd say, "Hey, turns out, or like, like I wanted some aviators once and I never got them, so I should have, I should have done this actually." It's like you know what? I kind of, I don't know if I really want those aviators or not. I don't know if I want those or not. And when I was a lot younger, that would be my way of of gauging whether or not I got what I wanted. Because it'd be like, "Well, I wish you would have told me this sooner." Like, aha. Gotcha. And then I, I wouldn't think I get told you guys what my parents do for Christmas gifts most of the time. What's that? They shop around now or even earlier. Yeah. <laughs> and then they package them and hide them away so they forget what they actually got for themselves. Yeah. That's a, so my that's dad will good. be Christmas. My dad goes, I wonder what it is. My mom will say, you bought it. He goes, yeah, but I've forgotten what it is. And then he opens it and goes, oh my God, it's exactly what I wanted. She goes, I know you bought it. <laughs> it's a surprise for everyone. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I actually wanted to bring up, I think I mentioned, I, I wanted to bring up, a a template that I've noticed lately. Um, mm -hmm. I mentioned before that my wife and I are watching a lot more HBO shows lately, and I've noticed a trend of the HBO mom. Now, HBO likes to do their, like, everything's gotta be, gotta have a layer of seriousness, and it's gotta have, like, drama, and all the characters in our shows have to be super fleshed out, because it's like you're watching a long movie, not just a TV show. So, I've noticed three specific archetypes for HBO moms that it's hard to, to not tell if someone is falling into one of these, and it's the mom with too much agency, the mom with, um not enough agency and the mom who discovers agency and those are those are all the hbo mom uh stereotypes um 
the mom with too much agency being uh selena myers from veep uh julia louis dreyfus um she's the most horrible mother i think i've ever seen in fiction uh, she's she constantly undermines her daughter. She uses her for her campaigns. Uh, she pretty openly ignores her unless it's time for her to like to say, okay, I need to drag you out for for something. Uh, and she's just so selfish. Uh, I think there was one episode recently where um, uh, her mom uh, passes away in the episode and. In the hospital room, they start cheering because she won a like some state in, in the local election, and her daughter comes in and has a complete breakdown because she missed the moment of her her grandma passing because she had to go out and get coffee for the president's office. Um, <clears throat> and she's like, "Why? Are, why is everyone cheering? Did she get better?" And um, Selena Julia Louis Dreyfus's character is like. No, you missed her. You missed Nana go. But we won the state. We won Nevada. Um, and then later on in the episode, she talks about like, I can't believe I had such a selfish mom. I can't imagine what it would be, what it would be like if I raised you like this. And it's played as comedy, but it's also like, it's, it's so horrible watching it pan out. Mm -hmm. The mom with uh, not enough agency is um, Livia Soprano. Because she constantly is telling people who who she wants to see killed and they end up doing it but it's only because she's spiteful and doesn't realize how much power she holds she thinks she is she is the like just everyone's punching bag she believes that nothing that she wants will ever go her way she's nihilistic uh to a point where she gets the like um her grandson uh Tony Jr., uh, she pretty much opens up the pathway for him to become a nihilist as well because she believes that she's like, she has no agency when in fact she does. But it presents her as if she doesn't realize that she's trying to play the victim to everyone. Like she has become so paranoid and, and deeply unhappy with her own life that she's given up on the thought that it's affecting people around her. Because she doesn't think she has that power anymore. Where the first few seasons of The Sopranos is about people trying to capitulate to her. Often to their 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 horror or some very big misfortune happening. The last one is, um, I, you know what? This is ironic, but I can't remember her name. Uh, the mother from, because I, I actually dropped this show. Uh, my, my wife kept watching it. In the last two seasons, I kind of lost interest. But it's the mother from Six Feet Under who begins the show as kind of just like the 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 wife of the the main character's parents and as the show goes along she becomes her own character and she starts having more relationships where she only had the one relationship with the um, main character's dad who his death kicks off the plot and as it goes along she starts to really like she starts to stand up for herself and she starts to tell her kids like I was I coddled you too much or um, at one point she says, like, this is all going to be okay. It's just believe, just believe it's going to be okay. And stuff doesn't turn out okay. So, like, she kind of starts to to think, like, it's okay. Whatever happens is out there in the universe and I can't change it. But being, like, hopelessly optimistic is also kind of a way to get downtrodden in life. And if you just kind of go along with it and become your own person, you're stronger for it. Even though she's... Uh, she comes up with this later in life. She becomes a a better person as the series goes along until the point where, um, not, without giving anything away, but there are people who are not even realizing they're being abusive to her, but she still is able to say like, okay, we're, I'm cutting you out. We're, you're done here because I've I've dealt with this before and I've dealt with this kind of treatment before. And I know now that um, I'm like, I wasn't as good a mom as I could have been, and I wasn't uh, as strong a person as I could have been. So um, rather than coddling her children, she starts being more like direct and more um, more true to herself. So she's not just the the picturesque mom. She's not just the picturesque wife. She becomes her own person. And as a result, she like everyone around her 
kind of has a, a better life because of it. Um, and HBO kind of plays with all three of those archetypes all the time. Mm -hmm. But those are the three that really stand out to me because they're such well-written, kind of beautiful characters, even though uh, two of them are awful. Well, that's nothing new. I mean, if you watch the Learning Channel, it's all tiger moms. If you watch the Hallmark Channel, it's all moms who discover a terrible secret. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh oh yeah. That's um, that's that's um something that I don't like in fiction. Whenever it's like the mom discovers that the the husband was you know seeing other women or whatever, and she kind of she comes to realize that her relationship is is all a lie. Like it kind of it kind of narrows down like. A person isn't just their relationships, they're everything else around them. And whenever it's like, I found out a truth about myself that someone else is doing something, like, it's kind of a simplistic way of, of these same kind of archetypes where a, a really well-developed character will, will see that other things in their life, other aspects of their life are also a lie or that there are hidden truths to them. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it it does, but it makes me think that you're very young. Um, <laughs> uh, that because the the truth is that when you are not that you're defined by your relationships, like you're more than someone's spouse, someone's child, someone's parent, uh, but. When you are betrayed by someone that you have that close connection to, it does alter your perception of yourself because of the relationship. Because it's like, okay, even though I've been your child my whole life, or even though we've been married for 30 years or whatever, you betrayed me in this horrible way. So it changes the way that you think of yourself because of the drastic change in your reality, knowing that this person thought so little of you that they could just betray you. And, and like, Inevitably, in those sort of circumstances, whoever the bad person is in, in the scenario will say something like, it didn't mean anything. It's like, that makes it worse, not, not better. Uh, so, yeah, it, it does. Uh, to, to, to be the betrayed person will shatter you. Uh, it it will, um, and and then you have to do the thing where you rebuild yourself and go. Okay, who am I? Who am I? Disconnected from that relationship, without that connection to that parent, that partner, that child, whatever. Uh, who am who am I on my own by myself? And then you can have that hopefully, growth of character that proceeds from there. But in the instant and for a while after that, uh, it's it's going to be a demolition zone. And I can also see it turning into a really toxic mindset, too, where you think, well, if someone's lying to me, who else is lying to me? And that can also happen. What, what else in my life? Am, like, Am I just naive? Is everything around me, like, have, have has everyone known that i'm foolish like yeah, yeah i can i can see that yeah okay i'd like to finish up with what i think is the worst mom archetype out there all right it's probably not you know what you guys think because it's not necessarily the horrible mom it's i'm gonna call it the stand by your man mom mm -hmm. and it's usually something like a sports <laughs> movie or somebody who takes a new job in in a new town and brings the wife wife and kids along with him and the 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 woman is only there to do the speech where he's down at his lowest point and she like comes in and goes don't you give up we've worked too hard for this type of thing wow. and a lot of times what i really hate is when it's a really really good actress and i'm like oh she's completely wasted in this role she is completely wasted in this role 
Yes, they exist to uplift the husband. The and, uh, and she's got nothing to work with here. I mean, it's just, it's just by the numbers. Um, and I hate those, those, those type of mom archetypes. And you see them all the time, especially sports movies for some reason. Yeah. Yeah, no, I get that. Um, can, can we, can we flip side it? What, what about, uh, the, the, the really good, the really good mom. Let's let. Can we end on really good moms? Okay, I'm gonna go. Morticia Anyone seen Hereditary? Adams. What? Did you say Pet Cemetery? <laughs> no, he said Hereditary, no, which is worse. I was joking. <laughs> okay. Uh, Morticia. It's Adams. hard to do that because, again, good good stories don't necessarily always have good moms. You know what I'm saying? It, it, oh, I mean, for sure. The conflict and stuff like that. Yeah. So I'm kind of struggling. I mean, they are out there, but I'm, I'm struggling to think of one. Joe, please, I'm going to mute everyone else in here if you don't get to talk. Okay. The, I, I, I was just going to say Morticia Adams. I, oh, okay. specific, specifically looking at the 60s television show and then like the like 20, 30 year old Tim Burton movies, that Morticia Adams, uh, because she can be different in different incarnations. Uh, but uh, loving wife, supportive mom. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like that's well, especially that's when they only have the, like that one scene. They're always in the background. But they don't. They don't really have any. They just say a few words every time, type of thing, until they have that that one scene. With the, and their entire job is to lift their husband up and push him back into the into the fray, basically. And I just I hate that cliche. I get that. I get that. <laughs> that 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 is a. I well, because you you ended up going a different way than I thought you were going to go because there is that thing about where. There'll be the mom character that is in a terrible relationship mm. where it's like, these people should not be married. They should not be living together. But the woman is standing by her man for the sake of the kids. It's like, I don't mind those stories because it's more of a cautionary tale. I view those more as a cautionary tale. Don't do that. The this. problem is, okay. We, we work on a campus, and I, I hope I get hate mail about this. I hope I get hate mail about this. People are stupid. So when they watch cautionary tales, they're like, oh, that's how I should live my life. They take the wrong caution out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, if, if you want to be with someone who's going to just stick with you forever, that's always going to be there for you, you should pick someone who's really abusive because you know they're going to stick around. As long as you can draw breath, they're going to stick around. And that's what I need. I'm going to need someone who's there for. Me. It's not it's not technically untrue, but it's also like the it's true in the most horrible way. Right. Like they're going to stick around because you don't have a choice. Uh huh. And, 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 and I know you said something about it, Chris, but there's a lot of people that look at the giving tree in that way. Because yeah, it's yeah, that thing right. where oh, it's like, okay, I'll provide you shade and, you know, apples. It's like, okay, yeah, that's great. But I'm going to cut you down so I can build a house out of you. That is too much. That is not yeah. a parent's job. It is not a parent's job to give away all of the pieces of them to well, build I'm, you a life. It's worse than that. They cut the branches down to make the house, which is recoverable. What I don't like is I want to go. On, I want to build a yacht and go out sailing. So I'm gonna cut your trunk down. That's where I go. Okay, that's 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 yeah. just that's just yeah. way too far. And 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 that is the the negative slant of that story that you love. Sorry, but he's gonna grow back. Tree's gonna tree. You say that, but no. Uh, a lot of times, you cut something down to the trunk, it can't survive. Yeah, tree, tree's gonna tree. <clears throat> no, I you know I was actually thinking about Morticia Adams as well uh, last night when I was gonna who's who's a mom that I really want to talk about here and I think it's just because she's so um, she's so open right like she and Gomez my my main uh, interaction with the Adams family is the Tim Burton movies sure. but 
she and Gomez love each other so much and they're so open about that and in front of their children as well. And their children are weird, but they're weird in the way that Gomez and Morticia are also weird. Uh And they're not, I mean, obviously they're always trying to murder each other comically or whatever, but it's all within the bounds that Gomez and Morticia have set for them. They're okay, if you want to do weird experiments or whatever, then do that, but you know, do them in the house. Which is, you know, when I, now that I say it like that, it's kind of weird. But um, also because they work on cartoon logic where it's like, yeah, you can blow each other up with dynamite and it'll be fine. You know, uh, they kind of have their own weird logic that, that yeah. they live by. But um, really, that's the thing that I think about is that she and Gomez are raising this family and they all love each other. Mm-hmm. Um, Pugsley and Wednesday, maybe not so much, but they're also siblings. Yeah. Um, but that's the that's the one thing that I that I think about. And one of the someone that I didn't want to bring in, but I now I guess I have to, is um Bandit and Chili from Bluey. Um I've had to watch Bluey on loop for uh, a year now, but um I actually really like Bluey. I think it's probably the best children's cartoon on right now, maybe one of the best cartoons airing, period. Mm-hmm. Um but I mean, it's, you know, anthropomorphized cartoon dogs, whatever. But the parents, like, they're always trying to play with their kids and set up boundaries and discipline them when need to when needed and uh, encourage them when they need to be encouraged. Um, but they also, there's an episode where they, they frame it as Bandit, the dad, and Chili, the mom, are just, they're really tired and they can't get up and they kind of have a headache. But it's New Year's Day. So when you're watching it as a kid, you're like, okay, well, the kids are trying to have fun with the parents, but they don't want to get up and they're eating chips and drinking soda. And there's one part where they're playing whale watching because it's the only thing that the parents don't have to get up to do. And um, Chili, again, the mom is like, she she just has like chips and like the dip and like a, a... can of soda and she's like don't do this this is what whales do kids you don't want to be like a whale and she's just drinking on the couch and um obviously as an adult you watch it and you're like okay these two drank way too much last night and they're so hung over they can't get up um but it's the fact that they still try their hardest to give the the two girls a a good upbringing but they also show like Bandit has um uh Bandit has problems like there's an episode that got traction recently where he's looking at a mirror and he's like, I I desperately I gotta start losing weight because like I'm I'm out of shape. I'm gonna be like I'm not gonna be able to play with you like I want and like it this is this is gonna cause problems later. And they're like, okay, well, you know, that's just part of being a dad or um and I mean I'm talking about the dad now, but Chili is also if you want to if you want to really ruin your day from preciousness watch the um the planets episode i can't remember what it's called but it's the the episode where they're they play the uh, planet suite can't remember what the the thing is called but you you'll know it when you hear it um that one and the episode where bluey learns how to walk um i don't think anyone's ever watched those episodes dry eyed um and they are totally focused on chili and it's it's about her trying to trying to raise the kids and it's about her really like down on herself because she's doubting if she's a good mom but by the end of the episode without saying so much the only thing the only time that it really tips its hand is one of the other moms says you're doing fine and it's like just the way that it's delivered is just like as a parent like at that when i watched it because Bluey is about that same age as, as our daughter was when we first watched it. It was like a weight was lifted because you see these other parents and they're cartoon dogs and you see them struggling and having another mom come by and say, I know, but you're doing great. It's, it's just like, it's, it's pure. It's just, it's pure therapeutic. I'll send those to you later, Joe. I have a feeling, Brian, you probably want to be interested, but um if we're talking about them anyway, Chili and Bandit are the best uh the best parents on television. So 
Okay. I'll throw one more out there since I actually I said, wait a minute, I'm a librarian. I can look this up. Um, this is a great one. I, 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 I'm, I'm mad at myself. I forgot it. Mrs. Brisby from The Secret of Nim. Yes. I, it's been a long time since I've watched that one. Yeah. You want to talk about a, a, a cartoon that is celebrating motherhood. That is... That is because she's an ordinary mom and she's trying the best she can and she's terrified of everything around her but she's trying and she doesn't give up i really really like this new i mean secret of nim's not new but like this the the trend that's kind of started in the last few decades of you can show kids that parents are human and that they're fallible and they're they're also trying their best as well as well they might put up a you know a strong face every now and then but they're human too uh, even though we're talking about cartoon animals but they're they're people too and they also are going to have that weakness um i think that's really important for kids to see that they that your parents will protect you and they'll do everything they can for you but it's still i mean i mean the word burden sounds bad but that is what that is sometimes And you shouldn't you shouldn't think of it as they're doing it because they think that you're going to owe them later. They're doing it because they love you. And I think we're about out of time. We're out of time. Joe, did you want to talk about anything going on uh, around town on campus? Yeah, coming up in the near future. I I, I have the 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 sheet to read from. Uh, some of these things are well, some of these things are are sort of recurring. Uh, the Wichita Falls Public Library still has story times on Thursday mornings at 1030, and they're going to be hosting another Maker Monday for kids who are aged uh, 6 to 11 on May 22nd. Uh, the Wichita Falls Ballet Theater is going to wrap up their season with The Sleeping Beauty uh, at our MSU Fane Fine Arts uh, Theater on May 19th and 20th. Uh, the next After Hours Art Walk will be downtown in Wichita Falls on June 1st. Uh, Backdoor Theater is hosting an evening of improv on June 17th. And this is terrifying, but I'm going to go ahead and mention it. Uh, we'll have more details coming in, month, in, uh, in, in the coming months. But go ahead and start making plans now to attend our October event, Rooftop Heroes and Tabletop Terrors. Uh, for more information about these and other activities, check out the events section of the MSU Texas homepage and the calendar at discoverwichitafalls.com slash events. And if you have comments, questions, or suggestions for us, drop us a line, library at msutexas.edu. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>